Argentina is living today what Brazil experienced five years ago. Amid a challenging economic scenario, voters chose a radical political outsider to be their president. Someone who promised to be like a wrecking ball for the political establishment, but also who allied themselves with traditional figures in order to cement their wins. In Brazil, it was the 2018 victory of Jair Bolsonaro. In Argentina, it is the triumph of Javier Milei, who describes himself as an anarcho-capitalist who uses a chainsaw as a symbol of his intentions to shrink the Argentinian state. If you like Explaining Brazil, you should subscribe to The Brazilian Report, the journalistic engine behind this podcast. We're an independent organization funded by subscribers, and you can help us stay independent and continue to produce award-winning journalism. And if you are already a subscriber, you can go the extra mile and join our Buy Me A Coffee fan page. In return, you get exclusive perks like special newsletters, behind-the-scenes content, as well as a shout-out here on our podcast. Today I'd like to thank our Buy Me A Coffee members, Gabriel Luca, Andrei Novoseltsev, Tom Nolan, Marta Martins, Pan Ludwig, Leslie Seal, Caroline Hubert, Mark Hillary, John Thomas III, Luis Hens, Erwin Menez, Orlando Black, Steve Knapp, Aaron Berger, James Coney, Kars Vresvik, Alasdair Townsend, Peter Abrahamson, Jim Ofadeju, Marco Fryer, Miller Renacido, David Dixon, José Rosi Stankovic, Emerging Market Muser, Jordan Iftar, Tanika Thompson, Anderson da Silva, Kat Kramer, Peter Suffering, Anna Lund, and someone who chose to remain anonymous. And our Buy Me A Coffee members come from all over the world, so please, if we're butchering the pronunciation of your name, do send us an email. And if you too believe in the importance of independent journalism and want to hear your name on our podcast, go to buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report and subscribe to one of the membership tiers. Click on buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report to learn more. Estoy seguro que es más importante lo que nos une que lo que nos separa. Porque eso es lo que va a hacer que pongamos de pie a la patria y volvamos a ser una potencia. So as usual, when we're talking Latin America, I welcome Ignacio Portes, our Buenos Aires-based Latin America editor, Nacho. Thanks for joining me after this massively eventful weekend in Argentina. Yes, it has, it has been a, a long campaign, a long year in Argentina, and there's still a lot of things going on and still a lot of things to happen because this transition is going to be intense economically, politically. So good to be here to talk about all of this. Nacho, it's been a crazy couple of months in Argentina. And at this point, we all know that Javier Milei won 56-44% against Sergio Massa, the economy minister of Argentina and the representative of Peronism, which is this political force that has been at the center of Argentinian politics for the better part of the past century. Now, a political shellacking like this doesn't happen out of nothing. What paved the way for such a striking victory from Javier Milei? You have to think that there are both national and international factors at play, right? Because Argentina's government has been in crisis throughout the, its whole the, its whole four year period. Really, the Alberto Fernandez administration came back in 2019 with a promise of um, revamping the purchasing power of salaries for Argentinian workers after a really failed government of center right Mauricio Macri. Uh, before him, uh, but the government has been chaotic. It's, it has been full, full of internal quarrels between the president and her and his vice president Cristina Kirchner, who is also who was the main actor of Argentina before before Macri in the in the past in the previous decade. So we've seen twenty years really of uh, in which the the Kirchner family was 
dominating Argentinian politics. And in the last four years, uh, that leadership has been in question between the Vice President Cristina Kirchner and Alberto Fernandez. And, and that the whole um, the whole government has been extremely chaotic and non-functional for most of, of the term. And this has uh, added to an economic crisis that, that has been brewing for a decade and getting worse and worse and worse. Inflation has risen to 150% and it's likely going to go significantly higher, probably twice as much as that next year. Uh, the purchasing power of salaries has continued to deteriorate. Uh, according to Argentina's poverty rate lines, which are different in each country, so you shouldn't compare Argentina's poverty numbers with the numbers of other countries directly because each country has its own measurements of poverty, right? But inside Argentina, with its measurements, poverty is higher than it was when 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 Alberto Fernandez took office. So the, the ruling Peronist administration had every chance of going out, right, uh, in, in in this context. Uh, but, uh, and, and really in a, in a broader context of, of the pandemic, that has meant that most government has have not re-elected in Latin America. In the, uh, I think from the last 19 elections, 18 governments have lost, 18 incumbents have lost since 2019. Only a couple of governments are popular in the whole region. Uh, AMLO in Mexico, Bukele in El Salvador, but most governments are unpopular. Lula is relatively popular too for, for now. Just as a Kevin, and to your point, Lula is much less popular than he was 20 years ago, which uh, to your point, it's like uh, the era of uber popular um, presidents in Latin America may be over with a yeah. couple of exceptions, but uh, even Lula, who is by far and by any measure Brazil's most popular um, leader, uh, he's also faces a very polarized electorate. Right. And we've seen we've seen in the last two decades in, in Latin America, especially in the first decade of the of the of this uh, 21st century, uh, governments that knew what what to offer ideologically, what to offer politically. We've seen this so-called pink tide of central left governments offering progressive politics and a and a and a uh, a lim some limits to the neoliberal policies we saw in the 90s and a, an active state presence to protect the poor and um, progressive politics, politics in general, uh, international alliances between these governments. And, and they all knew what to do, more or less. They had a recipe, everyone, Correa in Ecuador, uh, Lula in Brazil, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that, that, uh, th that idea started to be put in crisis, I think, in the last few years, even though these governments some of them have continued to clean, to hold on to power, uh, and and th there's been an emergence in the region and and in, in more than the region in North America too, in Europe of 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 a, of a nascent uh, right wing uh, movement that is uh, of a young right wing movement. I think that's what's interesting. It's that right wingers used to be old and decrepit and and losing and and and. Uh, and just on, on defensive, and now they're young, and 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 they have the, the political initiative across the world, uh, or at least across the West, right? Um, and that is what I'm was mm -hmm. saying when I when I what I what I meant when I said this is also an international phenomenon, right? We cannot ignore the international dimension of Trump, Bolsonaro, cast in Chile, uh, and many many more. Uh, who are rising figures. Some of them have struggled. We've seen them in government already, so we've seen. It, that it's not the same to be in opposition and just throwing rocks at whoever is in, in charge than having to actually manage things and seeing the complexity of the real world. And Trump has struggled, Bolsonaro has struggled, and they're out too. But uh, Millet is part of this. He has his his uh, you know idiosyncrasies. He has his own brand. He is a libertarian, economical guy who is not exactly the same as, as Trump or Bolsonaro. But he's definitely part of that movement. That he's he's a so so yeah. There are Argentina's economic crisis is much worse than anything in the in mostly anything except maybe Venezuela in the region, so that's a big big factor for Peronism's downfall and for the rise of an alternative. Uh, but uh, this is also part of something global, right? I mean, as a Brazilian, it's too tantalizing to make the comparison between Milei and Bolsonaro because it's like um, it's like when when you have cable and your neighbor doesn't, and you're watching a football game, and then they scream goal and you know like yes. the, the same goal is going to play out in your television and I, for us it feels a bit like that because five years ago we had um, a political establishment which was demoralized in our case 
by several widespread corruption scandals, in your case, by uh, this dreadful economic scenario. And then this guy who is an outsider, who many think it's a joke candidate, uh, comes and promises to change everything and to do everything unlike it has ever done before. And he says a bunch of outlandish uh, things. And every time he says like a bizarre statement, uh, political analysts point to that moment and say like, this is when he but lost actually that's when he won. the race, but then he... Exactly. And, uh, and I mean, and just like Bolsonaro, the one thing it's kind of interesting is that Millet comes uh, strong to the runoff, but then he uh, mm -hmm. allies himself with the establishment right. So in Brazil, we saw many of the people who fought with the Workers' Party tooth and nail for the presidency during the 90s uh, say, well, we don't agree with him, but he is the lesser evil, so we're going to fully support him. And we kind of saw that uh, with the coalition led by former President Mauricio Macri, right? And um, that alliance with Macri, who is a darling to the markets with someone who is seen as much more moderate force than Javier Millet, did that change Millet's program in any way, shape or form? Yes, uh, to many of, to every, to everything you say, probably, you said probably. Uh, first, uh, this has been a regional dynamic, as you say. The, what happened with Brazil happened really, if you follow like Colombia's runoff, Rodolfo Fernandez allied himself with the traditional right to try to beat Petro in the runoff. We, we've seen this nascent right wing and the establishment figures to, when they, they need a final push, they go for the established, for help uh, from the traditional right wing establishment of the country, right? Uh, we, we've seen it in many places. And it happened in Argentina too. Millet had an excellent performance in the primary, getting 30% of the vote. Then we have a three-part election in Argentina. Then in the general election, uh, he stagnated and he stayed at 30% when people were expecting him, analysts were expecting him to rise, to get 35, to keep showing uh, progress, but he stalled. And um, But that is where, where he joined forces with Macri and Bullrich and the traditional right-wing establishment of Argentina, uh, splitting the central right between the centrist and the right-wingers. But most voters went to the right. Most voters followed Macri and Bullrich. Even other centrist candidates signaled support for Millet. I think, I mean, it's always a question whether it was their support that did it or whether the politicians were just reading the the the, the side gaze of the moment and saying, this is the, the guy who's going to win. And I'm, if I support him now, I'm going to have a, a, a ticket to be a part of his government. Sorry? Right, yeah, right. And, and, also, effect, right. and if I support him, the I am going to have effect, a, a right. stake in the future Rather government so for my so for power, right? And uh and I think but I think Macri, Mauricio Macri, the former president of Argentina, saw this coming a little bit. He 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 has changed his his public persona a little bit. He has always been a right winger from uh, from in his heart, right? A, a, a strong right winger. But uh, when he had to, when he was close to government in 2015, he uh, started to moderate himself ahead of the runoff. Uh, and, and during the campaign, really, he tried to present himself as a, as a centrist technocrat who just wants to get rid of the Kirchner family and have a, a, a more uh, uh, reasonable government that is less conflictive and, and so on. Uh, but, uh, but, he never felt fully comfortable with that and with some of his allies and his government was full of, of internal quarrels in that regard. And when he failed, he became convinced that the reason he failed was that he was too moderate, economically especially. Mm -hmm. and, 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 he didn't, and, he, and he also started thinking that some of his allies uh, backstabbed him, stuff like that. So, and he started to read the, the sign of the time. So he, he really turned from a, a, an Obama alignment at the start of his, of his mandate in, in 2016, Obama came to Argentina, had a lot of meetings with Macri. He was a darling of Obama. To moving in, uh, to get take pictures with Trump, uh, he visited Trump a couple of times. He started building links with with Trump. Trump, in fact, was the guy who financed uh, when Macri had a massive debt crisis at the end of his of his period. He was the guy that green lighted the biggest loan in IMF history to trust to support the Macri government until the end and, and, and stop him from completely collapsing. He gave him $50 billion, 
which is massive amount of money for Argentina. And since then, Macri has been. He was also he was also in bed Macri. with Bolsonaro, who for yes. many in the region Macri, was yes. radioactive. Yes, right? and uh, yes, uh, yes. He he he, 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 he Bolsonaro was in power at the time, and he he felt they felt comfortable. They naturally felt all right when they talked to each other. The tension that you saw between Alberto Fernandez administration and Bolsonaro was nothing like that during Macri the Macri Bolsonaro years. So Macri was. A bit between both uh, sides, uh, and, and he has been aligning farther right recently, and he has been a key member behind the scenes of the Millet campaign. Macri played two candidates really. He favored Bullrich and he favored Millet at the same time in a more coy way. But Millet yesterday during his campaign, during his acceptance speech at night, the one of the I don't think I don't know if it was the first person or second person he thanked was Santiago Caputo who is a, a, as the chief of his campaign, as a real mastermind behind the scenes of his campaign. And that is a guy from the Caputo family, which was the best friends of Mauricio Macri, uh, a powerful finance uh, family in Argentina that has always been the behind the scenes, the, the, the people that do the behind the scenes dirty work of Macri, both in, 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 in finance matters and in international alignment matters. Uh, so that, that, that thank you message was very telling of what really happened during the campaign. I think uh, Macri was always playing, I think, both horses. And if Bullrich won, who was his official horse, great. But if not, he had a, a B plan with, with Millet. And now we, we, we've seen him, after, when Bullrich was out of the runoff, he immediately came to endorse Bullrich, as we've told in, the, in our newsletter. Uh, to, sorry, Macri and Bullrich came to endorse Millet uh, immediately after it was, we had a confirmed Millet versus Massa runoff. And, and since then, it's become obvious, right? But... Behind the scenes, it was already happening. En definitiva, siempre que quieran sumarse al cambio que la Argentina necesita, serán bienvenidos. Sabemos que hay gente que se va a resistir. Sabemos que hay gente que quiere mantener este sistema de privilegios para algunos y que empobrece a la mayoría de los argentinos. A todos ellos quiero decirles lo siguiente: dentro de la ley todo, fuera de la ley nada. No, and I mean, this alignment between Macri and Millet will give Millet a majority in Congress. I mean, what's the outlook of the Argentinian legislature? Uh, and I mean, how will that be an obstacle for a Millet government? That is a very, um, you got to go through a really fine comb to understand Congress right now. Because we're, what we're going to see right now, now is a realignment of many things in Argentina. It's not so obvious who is who. You have to look at the individual guys. Because you have, you generally have blocks, right? You, it's easy when things are normal. You know, okay, this thirty percent is this party, thirty percent is this party, forty percent is that party. All right. But inside those parties, there's a lot of forces. There's a lot of complexity, and uh, even inside Peronism, there's a lot of complexity. There's even a couple of people in Peronism who might support some Millet reform. Especially because Peronism is like, is Peronism right wing or left wing? And the answer is yes. <laughs> right. Lately, it has been left wing, but Massa, Massa is not a leftist at all. He's a pragmatic politician, a centrist who will do what's needed uh, at the times. What the what the what he's like. His mentality is just pragmatism, uh, right? And uh, and. Uh, and uh, some people even say that they, at, at some point, Millet had some links to Peronism. When he was very, very young uh, politically, like 10 years ago, he was trying to build some links with Peronism. Very um, uh, small things, right? But uh, so there might be some bridges there. There's even talk that might be interesting to you that even the Brazilian ambassador, uh, Daniel Scioli, who is a former presidential candidate of Peronism, he has some links with Millet through... Uh, he's likely interior minister, Millet's inter future interior minister, Guillermo Francos. So maybe Scioli even stays as the ambassador of Brazil. It's a possibility that he, he was the ambassador in, of Argentina in Brazil during uh, Macri, no, sorry, during Alberto Fernandez central left administration, but maybe even he might stay during Millet. I don't know, but it's a possibility. So there are these weird, there are lots of you have to look at the people, uh, at the individual cases right now to see who will be who. And it, uh, inside the, the center-right, centrist Juntos por el Cambio coalition, there will be there, there is already an obvious split between the Macri and Bullrich people who will go for Millet and others who will go for... for uh, 
more independent neither sense. nor yeah yeah neither nor centrist thing and these people they are aligned with uh, buenos aires city mayor uh Horacio Larreta, right 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 exactly that that is a, a good way of seeing it uh la reta is part of this block and the traditional radical party who is a an old middle class party in argentina but important it will also be part of this centrist block not aligned with Millet. but you have to look law by law decree by decree are they, like maybe they don't maybe even macri doesn't support some things of Millet dollarization i don't know if he's going to support that idea he doesn't like it but many other things, like strong slashing of state spending, you will support it. And uh, some guys have interests in the provinces they rule. So maybe there's a deal. If I give you this to your province, uh, maybe you support me in this stuff. It's going to be law by law. Millet, per se, has very little in Congress. He has, I mean, he has much more than he used to. He has like eight senators. But even those senators, he doesn't even know some of them. Like Millet grew so fast that he doesn't even know what's inside his party. He just told some people, okay, do something for this eight provinces. I have, I don't know no one there, don't know anyone there, just build some alliances there. And he doesn't even know what's inside of his coalition in some places, right? So the proof will be in the pudding. <laughs> yes. And, 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 and if you really want to understand it, you have to be, you have to look at it case by case. And, and it's a detective work, but, but he can build it. I mean, he can build it because he will have Macri by his side. And that is big. Macri more or less managed to govern. He managed to build the bridges, alliances. He has some experience. He's He was meeting with Millet until very late in the night, building the transition. Macri knows what a transition looks like, a quick transition. Macri won a runoff in very similar circumstances in 2015, and he had three weeks to build a government, uh, much bigger than he expected because he won much, much more provinces than he was expecting to win. So Millet will copy him. And speaking of building the government, Millet said on Sunday that the reconstruction of Argentina started that day. Uh, has he announced any day one measures for December the 10th when he takes office? Has he announced uh, uh, important members of his future cabinet? What do we know so far uh, about what will be this uh, one of a kind administration in Argentina? He has announced a couple of names. I mean, justice minister uh, who will run social security, but it's just here and there. You know, you, the big, big names that everyone's worried about, economy minister, cabinet chief, uh, stuff like that. Still a, still a question mark. Interior minister probably is going to be this guy, Guillermo Francos, who is the, like the centrist figure in the coalition who can talk to everyone. Uh, but the big questions are still open. Uh, he, he had announced, what's interesting is, he had announced a central a guy to run the central bank, who was Emilio Campo, who is the proponent of dollarization, who no one believes in, especially in the macro coalition, no one believes in. So it will be interesting if that guy actually stays as the, as the future central bank chief. That's going to be something interesting to follow. But mostly what's going to happen, I think, for, for the next three weeks is Macri and Millet building the team behind the scenes. And maybe we're going to know it the day before he he he, he takes office. Because... Uh, they are, there's a lot of positions to fill in and uh, we'll see what he does in terms of names. But in terms of policy, what we are seeing, I think, is the idea that we, we will have a Macri rerun on steroids, uh, like a stronger version of Macri. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the, at least that is the blueprint I have in my mind right now. And I think that's what markets are seeing too, because they really liked uh, the results yesterday. They didn't like Millet's win in the primary. That's very interesting. After Millet's primary win, markets dropped significantly uh, because his proposals, even though Millet's a market fundamentalist, the most market fundamentalist president you have probably seen in the world in the last hundred years is Javier Millet. He's, his whole mind is built on supply and demand. Total laissez-faire. Yes. And, and just everything he thinks about it like that is, is a mechanistic a brain that just everything is is uh, supply and demand in the markets and, and Austrian economics. He even applies it to like, you know, the organ uh, donor. It should be markets. It should be a free market of organs, uh, according to his philosophy. Uh, so he is an extremist in this regard. And, and uh, bankers and investors are more pragmatic people and that are out there in the real world. And we're a bit, uh, I don't know if this is going to work. This um, dollarization proposals don't convince us at all, but the, the arrival of Macri was very important for 
securing these upper middle class uh, elderly boats that went for him in the in the in the run of to give that maybe they would have gone many of them anyway but to give uh, calm to these people to say okay this is not so much uncharted territory if I'm putting the my my balance for Millet he was important in that regard and he he is important for markets right now who have massively rallied today in Argentina 20 30 40 percent rises in the stock market there's <clears throat> even rumors that he's going to privatize Argentina's biggest oil company I mean he has said he wants to do that well, although it's hard to do it in Congress, there's a lot of problems to do it. But yeah, that's exactly what I want to ask you because Millet told the radio station today that anything and everything that can be privatized will be privatized. And Bolsonaro said the same thing in Brazil, uh, but by the end, he managed very few privatizations. Even if one of them, of uh, Eletrobras, which is a massive power company here, was quite consequential. But I mean, how? likely is Malay to deliver on these promises? Because, I mean, uh, in Brazil for many years, and that has changed a little bit, but still, for many people, privatization is a dirty word. How is in Argentina in that regard? I think in Argentina, there's a, there's been a cultural change in the in the last few years. We've been saying some things about this in our podcasts, in our, in our newsletters, in our website, uh, that Argentina's culture has been shifting to the right uh in economic terms too we we talked about the poll that talks that in which Argentinian people say they value private initiative more they value privately created jobs and this didn't used to be like that 20 years ago it was the exact opposite when the Kirchner were start when the Kirchner family was starting to rise when the neoliberal consensus of 2001 collapsed uh, the, the the ideology of the people was the opposite you saw uh assemblies in the streets like it was uh, the French Revolution and in the middle of Buenos Aires city. And now you see the exact opposite. You see people calling for police and order and no one protesting in the streets and, 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 and private initiative and um, less state intervention and so on. But one thing is the abstract idea and the other thing is to actually make it happen and tr transitioning for a, from a very strong state to a very private economy can be extremely, massively, brutally painful. I mean, just look at, I don't know, the fall of the USSR. Just look at what happened in Venezuela when Maduro did a pro-market turn a couple of years ago. It, the poverty levels can rise brutally if you suddenly slash uh, social protections, if you privatize massive, uh, if you slash a lot of public jobs. If, you, if uh, as, as is the case in Argentina, the currency has a, a pegged value uh, and suddenly you free to the market and there's a massive devaluation. Uh, I, it, it, that kind of transitioning from the the idea to the reality can be brutal and, and people can, the support that Millet has right now, which is very significant, um, could start to shrink when people start seeing what, what his government, what the, the, the painful consequences of, of, of such changes are. And um, the one thing that I think is likely to happen soon uh, is the, the elimination of Argentina's crazy ex multiple exchange rates that we have been talking a lot about them in 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 our in the Brazilian report. And, and naturally, if you can just explain a little bit what are those many crazy uh, exchange rates, uh, if you can in a nutshell for people who are not familiar with it. Well, it's crazy if you haven't lived it because it's it's it. it because it's so foreign to people to know to people's experience in in, in countries uh, who have just like their currency has one value and not ten, but uh, basically Argent Ar Argentina's peso is 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 terribly poor and weak and no one believes in it, so it's constantly devaluated. But the government doesn't want to accept that devaluation, so it tries to sustain its value artificially by. Um, Loaning money in order from foreigners, uh, from the U.S. first, from China, from whoever it can be, from the central bank's reserves, to in order to try to keep the official value of of the currency stable, they want use for imports and exports, while the free market va value of the currency used for, if you want to, want to actually buy that currency and have physical dollars in your house, uh, goes much higher because there's rest restrictions to buy those dollars uh, uh, through normal channels. So you start to get uh, an official market and a black market 
of, of for the value of the currency. And then you have a lot of mixture of these markets and, and it gets more complicated, but that's the basic idea. And uh, the, the thing is that th this is all done to avoid devaluation, which is which are uh, painful, right? But at, at some point, the, the government cannot keep loaning money and cannot keep using its reserves because it runs out of international reserves and gold and whatever central banks have, right? Uh, to sustain the official value of the currency. And the devaluation becomes inevitable and the, 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 the pegged price of the peso eventually converges with the with the with the much higher uh, official uh, sorry free market value of the of the currency and there's a, a massive devaluation and I think that's what we're going to see right now. We saw that in 2015 when Macri came to power. This was his first or second thing he did was uh, devaluate the currency and unify the multiple exchange rates that the Kirchners had. And I think we're going to see the same on the first day or the second day or the first week of Millet's administration. And that is going to immediately cause prices to rise. We're already seeing prices rising. If you There's reports that if you go to a supermarket right now, prices are rising uh, because uh, commerces are covering, right? They're, you're, they are uh, anticipating the, the devaluation. They're, they're rising the price of their stock in order to protect. Uh, like if you're selling, uh, whatever you're selling, you don't want to sell it below the price that, that it will cost you to rebuy it, right? Because you lose your, your capital. So the, the supermarkets are already hiking prices, and and we're that is going to cause social conflict from the start. No, uh, when when you talk about the, uh, the the rising costs for groceries, it reminds me of uh, when I was a kid in the early '90s in Brazil, and we had massive inflation of yes. over a thousand percent a year, like we did. and prices would change. Uh, more than once during the same day. So it would be like your parent or your grandparent. Someone would take like as many kids as they had. And when you entered the supermarket, it was like each one had a list of goods it was going to take and it would run before that guy, which had like the, the price tickets, uh, the price ticket machine would come and put a new price tag. So you would race the supermarket staff uh, to get like the the price the the previous price tag before they could alter the price again. Yes. Uh, so it, it's pretty much what your guys are living now, right? Not exactly, because that is uh, I think another level. That is thousands levels of inflation. That is what we saw in eighty nine here too, and what we Peru it happened in everywhere, like most countries in Latin America, right? Uh, but that is thousands of inflation. What we have right now is a hundred. So you you don't see prices rise two, three times a day. It's not that manic experience of, of you get your salary and immediately you got to run to the supermarket because tomorrow things are going to wor be worth 50% more and it's just insane. Tomorrow, things might be worth 5% more. It's still crazy that mm -hmm. they rise so fast, but you don't, it's not that completely insane dynamic of hyperinflation. It's constant price rise rises. But I don't think we're going to see that, um, that level of inflation. What we're going to see is a one-time massive uh, rise in prices, I think, because it's a it's a sudden devaluation, it's a sudden convergence of the of the official exchange rate with the black market exchange rate, and we we maybe we might see a month of or a couple of months of uh, forty percent inflation in the month, uh, which is crazy, uh, insanely high for any anyone in the world. Uh, but it's more of a one. It's more. It's a shock. It's a sudden shock, right? Uh, in 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 prices and not that kind of constant uh, insanity. I think that's that is the 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 foreseeable future right now in the coming months. It's a, a a price shock and an inflationary shock, and that is going to lead immediately to social conflict. And that is going to come probably with the first uh, signs of the chainsaw, right? The um, mm -hmm. slashing of public spending. Milei goes around with this chainsaw uh, without the part that cuts. Thankfully. So there's no accidents in the campaign. No one, no one has lost an arm so far. Uh, no. But it's but it symbolizes what he wants to do with the state, and he goes with this crazy face like a madman, saying, ah, "I want to destroy the Argentinian state." And we're gonna we're gonna start seeing some attempts at doing that much more strongly than Macri did. We're gonna see full ministries eliminated and people fired, and that's immediately gonna lead to conflict. The the rise in, in prices for basic goods for the working class. And the conflict with the state apparatus or with all the people that are going to be fired and uh, and they're going to try to close their offices and so forth, that is going to lead to immediate social conflict, I think. Now, let's uh, move to um, 
the international stage because I want to talk to you about the Brazil-Argentina relations. And I mean, football rivalry aside, these are two countries that are umbilically connected and they depend on each other. Uh, they are each other's main regional trading partner. Um, now, there's a massive pipeline project involving the two countries, lots of trade of industrialized goods. And of course, uh, they are the biggest members of Mercosur, which is a trade alliance that also includes Paraguay and Uruguay and possibly Bolivia soon if the Brazilian Senate votes it uh, quickly. Uh, now, the bloc is in this home stretch of negotiations with the European Union. And Brazilian negotiators have said they expect uh, an agreement to be reached by to be announced next month. But Millet has already talked about imploding Mercosur. He says the bloc is good for nothing. Nothing. Um, he also has voiced his opposition to joining the BRICS alliance of the be- developing countries and talked about severing ties with China. Um, now there is a lot to unpack there, but yeah. what can we expect? from his foreign policy. Because let's just remember also, he has called uh, Brazilian President Lula, so the president of his biggest neighbor and one of the big, the most important countries in terms of bilateral relations for Argentina, a communist and a crook. Um, and uh, Lula's press secretary said that there will be no uh, relationship until Lula gets an apology. So yeah. <laughs> what uh, could we expect from that foreign policy? Yeah, as you say, uh, Argentina and Brazil really have a pretty good relationship for for have have a, a pretty solid. Uh, really, there's no rivalry besides football, as you say. That the countries have a the the two populations are in good terms with each other. The governments generally have been in good terms with each other. In the last few years, we've started to see some conflict. When Bolsonaro and Milei, uh, first with Bolsonaro, right? We we saw tension between the two embassies. We saw this guy that we I just mentioned, Daniel Scioli, former Peronist presidential candidate, act as a buffer between Alberto Fernandez administration and um, Bolsonaro because Alberto traveled to Brazil when Lula was in jail, if you remember, to support him in Curitiba to I think uh, to 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 call for his release mm-hmm. during the presidential campaign of Alberto Fernandez. And when when the tide was starting to turn around for Lula, right, there were some signs already that maybe he could be back and that he might get a, somehow get out of his judicial, judicial troubles. So the, 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 the relationship between Argentina and Brazil started to have tensions uh, between during the Alberto Al Bolsonaro presidencies. And, and, and this guy, Scioli, was sent as a buffer in order to, he's another of these pragmatic parents who can talk to everyone, to, in order to, 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 to not break the, the block, right? To just find a way to be diplomatic and, and not have another problem that none of the administrations really needed. And he was quite successful in that because remember when they, uh, Brazil and Argentina negotiated the reduction of import tariffs, of common import tariffs, as a way of uh, keeping Mercosur uh, still together when there was a lot of momentum against the bloc, especially from Bolsonaro, who, just as Millet, uh, was always a Mercosur denier. Yes, yes, no, exactly. And uh, and Mercosur has a lot of tensions. Uruguay wants to do a, a free trade deal with China. He wants to move Mercosur in a more pro-market direction. Uh, Millet, obviously, would like to either move it in a very pro-market direction or just destroy it. And uh, and so now we're seeing the, the table shift. The tide turn, right? It, exactly the opposite in each country. Right now, Argentina it has a, a, a very radical right-wing government and Brazil has a center-left government. It used to be the other way around. Yeah, Nululi is outnumbered, right? Three to one. Right. He has three right-of-center presidents uh, who are to different levels skeptical of the bloc. I mean, what do you think could be the consequences for Mercosur? Because like you said, Uruguay is like a l'enfant terrible. It wants to uh, follow its own path. Paraguay has already said that if Brazil does not conclude uh, the negotiations with the European Union until the rotational presidency moves to Paraguay, uh, Santiago Peña said he will not continue negotiations and he will move to other trade deals with Asian partners. And now you have Millet, who is this sort of rogue president or like a wild card that nobody really knows 
uh, how far he will go in his re- to, to, to live up to his rhetoric. I think it's interesting that Millet told today in, in, a, in a radio interview, in the same radio interview that you mentioned, he said he was talking at 4.30 a.m. in the morning with Uruguay's president, Luis Lacachepo, who was, coincidentally, in China. Uh, <laughs> which is, uh, this is, for Lacachepo, China is very important because he is using China as a, as a, he wants to do a free trade deal with China in order to liberalize Mercosur. Millet hates China. China is weird because it's communist and, and pro-market. It's, it's a complicated <laughs> thing. But, uh, but Millet hates China for ideological reasons. But, he might have an understanding there with La Caixa maybe in some ways. And in, okay, let's open this for competition from whoever, from China, the U.S., whatever. So they 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 might find an understanding between Millet and La Caixa and the and and, the, and Paraguay. Uh, and Lula might be the odd guy, guy out, but Lula is, I think, a bit more uh, centrist in these matters than uh, the Kirchners. And so he might uh, be more. I mean, I mean, he wants more or less that they deal with Europe, at least with the Kirchners. They don't want at all. Uh, so uh, the Kirchners were even more protectionist. They didn't want the, the trade deal with, with the European Union that Mercosur uh, signed during the Macri administration. So, uh, but what I, what I really think is that in the short term, this will not be a priority for Millet. He will have so many problems uh, that uh, picking a fight with Brazil and, uh, and uh, Mercosur and getting to all these deals with China... Uh, he will have the economic front as the number one priority, the political front, uh, the international relationships. He has already said that his first trip will be to the United States, uh, although not, it's weird, it, not in a, for diplomatic reasons, but for spiritual reasons. Uh, <laughs> he's, he has a... He, has, he, has, he said he's going to go even before he takes yes, office, right? Yes, yes, yes. He will go before he takes office to the U.S., to talk with some rabbis, friend of him, friends of him in in Miami and New York, because he's having all this mystical conversion to Judaism. Uh, part of his, uh, he has a bit of a messianic thing in in his head about being the new leader of Argentina, and this has come with 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 religion, right? Uh, it's weird, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, uh, and he he's going to the first trip he's going to do is going to be to the U.S. and probably then to Israel. So I don't think he's thinking about Brazil. Uh, first right now. He will eventually deal with that, but uh, I think Mercosur is low in the list of priorities, and it has been low in the list of Argentina's priorities really during the last few years. Like Argentina's idea of the Mercosur is just, I don't know, let's not let it not, let's not um, let it just not be another, it there, but let's not let do it not be a much. problem in, in our day-to-day agenda, because we have so many problems, like inflation collapsing, social conflict, uh, the, the central bank, um, internal conflict between the parties, con- constant political campaigns that uh, Mercosur just is the, the 15th priority for, for these governments. So I think maybe it will be in the back burner for some time and maybe they'll try to smooth it out somehow. And, and But eventually he might try to do, he will probably try to do something with it and it will be in the liberal, in the, I mean, the direction is clear. It, he will push for liberalization. Or for the destruction of Mercosur, which is generally an overall protectionist customs union, as opposed to other uh, blocks that we've seen in Latin America, like the Pacific bloc, which was very much more pro pro market and pro commerce and no no protectionism. Uh, so, but it will be in that direction, whatever Millet does. But the timing might be later. It might not be the the, the first or second thing that that we see. Right. I think uh, with that uh, we are going to wrap. But uh, Nacho, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, it was great as always, and I'm sure we're going to have even more in depth analysis on Wednesday when we have our next Latin America Weekly newsletter. Right. Yeah. There's going to keep being news of Argentina. That's for sure. It's been an intense year, and I think it's going to be another intense at least a few months for sure. The transitions are the times in which most things happen in in most governments. So we're going to keep seeing Argentina in the news for sure. Nacho, thanks again. See you soon, man. See you. Bye-bye. If you like Explaining Brazil, please give us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. It takes only a second and it will help us reach a wider audience. Or better yet, subscribe to The Brazilian Report, the journalistic engine behind this podcast. 
We have a subscription-based business model and your memberships fuel our journalism and keep us going and growing. Thanks to our subscribers, we have been able to cover Brazil and Latin America extensively and our work has won and been shortlisted for several international journalism awards. More recently, our newsletters won the best newsletter prize in the Americas from the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers for a small or local newsroom. In order to keep doing that work, we need your support. Go to brazilian.report slash subscribe. I'm Gustavo Ribeiro. Thanks for listening. Explaining Brazil will be back next week.